Today you will read the sermon text along with me. We're going to read together Psalm 121 as printed in your order of service. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where will my help come? My help comes from the Lord, who made heaven and earth. The Lord will not let your foot be moved. The Lord who keeps you will not slumber. The Lord who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. The Lord will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time on and forevermore. I lift up my eyes to the hills. When you hear these familiar words from Psalm 121, how do you feel and when do you feel it? Is it when you're driving north on 421, just past exit 272, where the highway suddenly points you straight at a mountain peak, blue and blooming on the horizon? Or standing on an overlook at our mountain camp, Laurel Ridge? The mountains just feel like the place, as it says in the King James, from whence cometh my help. I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills, from whence cometh my help. To me, that used to be a very inspiring statement. Until I began to realize through learning a little Hebrew and reading other translations that it is probably not a statement, but a question. Imagine a traveler looking up with fear at a range of mountains that he must cross and asking, from where will my help come? But if Psalm 121 lets the traveler ask the question, Psalm 121 also lets the traveler give the answer. My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. What does it mean that help comes from the Lord? In this psalm, it boils down to one word. It's a verb. We know that this verb is the point because it's used six times in eight verses. So I'm going to read the verses again, and I invite you to listen for that verb. The Lord will not let your foot be moved. The Lord who keeps you will not slumber. The Lord who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. The Lord will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time on and forevermore. Did you hear it? Keep. Keep is one of those words that's fun to look up in the dictionary because you'll find so many meanings and so many idiomatic uses that you will be glad you already speak English so you don't have to learn all those ways to use the word keep. But deep in its past, the word keep is related to verbs about careful watching, words like observe and stare. So maybe the Lord is your keeper means God is always watching, even staring at you. And if God is always watching, God can see when we're about to get in trouble. So presumably that is why the text says that God won't let your foot be moved, or as a more vivid translation says, God does not let your foot stumble. That is a reassuring thought when you're about to climb a mountain. On the other hand, what about when you do stumble? I did. I tripped over something and I fell and I broke bones. And I wasn't even climbing a mountain, I was just crossing a street. If God is always staring at me, then God saw that my right toe was about to catch that broken off lane marker and did not guide my foot around it. Does that mean God wasn't watching after all? I got a lot of wonderful get well cards after my fall, and there was one that really made me laugh. It showed a guy with a halo sipping a latte and scrolling on his phone. 
and the tagline was, ever get the feeling your guardian angel went out for coffee and just lost track of time? <laughs> we can joke about a guardian angel, but we might be uncomfortable joking that God wasn't watching. Psalm 121 says, the Lord who keeps you will not slumber. We don't want to ask whether God was asleep. And yet it's right there in the Psalms, not the one we read today, but Psalm 44 cries, rouse yourself. Why do you sleep, O Lord? The Psalms are the voice of humanity talking about and to God. And so they embrace all human experience of God. The Psalms give voice to both our confidence that God is our keeper and our deep uncertainty sometimes about exactly what that means. Among the sample phrases, excuse me, remember, keep is a fun word in the dictionary because we use it in so many ways. Keep up, keep back, keep at it, keep in mind, keep house, maintain, retain, persevere, hold, tend. That's just a few of the many meanings. And among the sample phrases like those I just read, I was particularly struck by this one. Keep the Sabbath. That's going back to those really old roots for keep, the roots that mean something like observe. Keep the Sabbath. Caught my attention because Sabbath observance, described in the Hebrew scriptures and more thoroughly parsed and detailed over centuries, requires so much of the observer. Now let me say, I am not talking about church attendance. No matter what you might remember from Sunday school, keeping the Sabbath is not Christians showing up for worship. An Orthodox Jew can tell you, Sabbath observance is detailed and demanding. It is a commitment. And it's a commitment that shapes one's daily decisions and the very rhythms of life. Isn't that true of any real commitment? You give yourself to a commitment in a way that shapes the choices and the meaning and the rhythms of your life, sort of like how a metronome helps you keep time. Keeping is committing. The Lord is our keeper. The Lord commits to us completely, without condition or reservation. Does God's commitment to keep us Keep us from falling and getting hurt? No. Does the Lord will keep your life mean your mortal life will not end? No. Pain and stumbling and tragedy are not evidence that God is not committed to us. However, our questions about pain and stumbling and tragedy are evidence of our struggle to understand God's commitment to us. Naturally, we struggle to understand. That struggle is the product of our deep longing multiplied by the magnitude of God's mystery. St. Augustine, the revered theologian of the early church, said that when we think we have comprehended God, that only means we have comprehended something else instead of God. Then again, something else is sometimes useful as a touchstone of sorts, in his parables, Jesus sometimes featured a character who was clearly not God, so that his listeners could think about what God might be in comparison. We've talked about this before, the how much more argument that is especially prevalent in the Gospel of Luke, and you heard it today. If a human being can do this much good, how much more good can God do? Andrew read the parable of the unjust judge. That judge proudly says of himself, I don't fear God or respect people. That guy is not God. He is committed not to justice, but to his own self-interest. Yet even that commitment ultimately produces a just outcome for someone else. How much more does God's commitment produce for humanity? Look at the unjust judge and look far beyond and see perhaps a glimmer of what God's commitment might look like. Marvel at how little we know about God's commitment and yet 
how greatly we are blessed by it. The parables aren't the only biblical lens through which we might view God's commitment. In the Hebrew scriptures, there's a little word with big power. The word is hine. And the King James usually translates it as behold. Many modern English translations just leave it out as the NRSV did in our psalm today. But it is there in Psalm 21 in Hebrew. Hine, behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The word behold in the Old Testament is often a command to shift our perspective. Look at this action through this character's eyes. Perhaps here in Psalm, 21, Psalm 121, the word points us toward all we could see if only we could see through God's eyes. God knows that God is committed to us in ways we cannot understand, but for which we should be deeply grateful, eternally grateful. We can't fully understand God's commitment to us, but we have illustrations of it all around. Surrounded by the glories of creation, we can reflect that the same God who made heaven and earth has committed to be our help. Reading the words of scripture, we can marvel like the author of 1 John, see what love the Father has given us that we should be called children of God. And if we cannot fully understand God's commitment to us, we can certainly work harder to understand our own commitment to God. We have illustrations of what a human commitment can look like. Consider the example of keeping Sabbath, how it shapes decisions and meanings and rhythms. Drawing an analogy with that sense of keeping, we can ask, how are we keeping God? How do we let God shape our days and rhythms? How much more can we do? And we have the example of that pilgrim in Psalm 121, gazing at a fearsome mountain range ahead. Where does my help come from? That's a question. But I will lift up my eyes to the hills is a commitment to a journey. It is our commitment to a journey. Some faith traditions quote Psalm 121 in their liturgy of baptism. Others use it in funerals. It reminds us that however we feel about it, we are committed to traveling from birth to death. And that means we will hike through some very demanding terrain. On that journey, our help comes from the Lord, who made heaven and earth and each one of us. The same Lord who in the person of Jesus Christ came to earth as a man on a journey. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. Jesus committed to a journey, unsettled though it was, painful though it would be, because he committed himself to God's will for our sake. Our best hope for committing faithfully to God's will is to commit in community to profess our commitment in the presence of others, to be in relationship with those who are also committed, to commit, in other words, to the church. We cannot fully understand the depth and breadth and height of God's commitment to us, but in our commitment each to each, we can see perhaps a glimmer of what God has in mind for us. If we commit to God and one another this much, how much more does God commit to us? We can only marvel and be grateful together. And bonus, when we commit to Christian community, we commit to journeying together. Because the terrain is difficult, we will all stumble, but we will not all stumble at the same time. So we can catch each other. That's one way God helps us in the journey. As part of God's commitment to us, God gives us each other. And God keeps all of us, keeps our going out and our coming in from this time on and forevermore. Amen.